Well, good morning and welcome. Thanks for joining us for another um, edition of online worship. And if you haven't heard, we announced this week, but this will be our last uh, Sunday of doing exclusively total uh, online worship. Now, let me explain. What we announced this week is that we are going to be easing back in to uh, live worship. And so what we're going to do is a week from today, on June 7th, we are going to be opening our doors for live worship. Our service is going to start at 1030. That's our normal time, at least before all this started. And we're going to be taking some precautions to ensure that, that you're safe and that others in our church body can safely worship together. So a few things. One, we're going to be opening our doors at 1020. Um, If you're a little earlier than that, we're just going to ask you to wait. At 1020, we'll open our doors. We will have somebody opening the door for you so that you can walk in. It just helps limit um, our exposure to germs. Then we're going to have an an usher who um, brings you in and uh, shows you where to sit. We're going to be trying to sit in a way that keeps up those social distancing guidelines. That's where why we're going to do it that way. We're also going to have um, ask those ushers to usher you out at the end of, of the service. And uh, finally, we're going to encourage uh, face masks. So if you have a face mask, um, you are, are, are welcome uh, to wear it. If you feel more comfortable doing that, we'd encourage you uh, to do so. If you don't have a face mask and would like one, please let us know. We still have um, a way to uh, get you one if if you are in need and you are a part of our our church family. So uh, if you would like the full list of precautions that we're going to take, you can find them on our website, rosehillesc.com slash reopening. And so you can see more information um, there. One other thing, uh, that, that means that this Sunday is actually the last Sunday we do our life groups as they are. If you would like to continue in your life group, you can bring that up today as, as we meet after the service. Uh, if your group would like to, to find a different way to meet either in person or online, uh, you can do so. You're welcome to do that. Obviously, because we're switching the times up a little bit, um, some things are going to change there. But just so you know uh, what's coming up. And I also want to re- reiterate, if you're uncomfortable with live worship or you're, you're not quite ready or uh, if you fall into one of those categories of a vulnerable person either because of uh, age or, or some other type of illness, I'd encourage you um, to stay home. We're going to keep up this live stream. It's going to look a little different, but it's going to, we're still going to broadcast the service. You can still tune in and worship with us. So we're going to kind of ease into this and, and ease into um, worshiping together. And, and just to be quite honest with you, we're expecting in the next few weeks to start some construction on our uh, sanctuary anyway. And so we might find ourselves uh, switching things up again um, or forced to switch things up for a little while. And so we're going to keep you updated on all that, but just kind of know that that's where uh, we're at right now. If you would like to worship with us, you can do so uh, next week, either online like you're doing right now, or you can come um, and join us at 1030. One other thing, if you're a a member here at Rose Hill, one other thing you should note is we are holding a final vote this week for um, our uh, building project. We've done all our, you know, gone through all the the major votes on that. We've voted to go forward with everything. But uh, we have a final vote. It's a formality um, as part of this, this process uh, we're accepting um, ballots this week, and so if you're looking for more information on that, you should have gotten an email uh, this week. And you can vote by uh, sending an email into uh, Judy and just copying and pasting that motion and then saying yes or no uh, to that. So if you are a member here, I would encourage you to, to be a part of that as we get closer uh, to, that, to that build date. So um, please just uh, take that, uh, keep that in mind. Finally, uh, remember, as always, you can check us out online at our website, rosehillefc.com. If you'd like to check out more information, find more information about us. There's updates. We have our calendar there. All this information that I just gave you right now, you can find there. You can even give on our website, rosehillefc.com slash give. So we're going to jump into uh, God's Word and and into a a message time. Uh, I I would encourage you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 4, if you have a Bible with you or on your phone or on a browser window. You can turn there. We're going to be there in a little bit. But we're finishing up a series this morning as we've been talking about spiritual habits. And this morning, I want to talk to you about the spiritual habit of evangelism. Uh, Before we jump in, I just want 
you to think about some sobering statistics. I want you to, to think about this with me. Did you know right now there are about 7.5 billion people on this planet? That's a rough estimate, but uh, fairly close. 7.5 billion people. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear billion, I don't even know. I don't, I don't even have a category in my brain for that. I just know that's a lot of people. But consider this, if you were to ask 7.5 billion people if they have accepted uh, and proclaimed Jesus Christ as their Savior, estimates say that about 10 to 11 percent, so around 750 million people would say yes. Now that's a ton of people. What's awesome about that is there's a ton of believers in Jesus on this planet. But, but here's the sad part, it's about 10 to 11 percent. The number of people who have heard the gospel, they have access to it, they have churches and Bibles and and people proclaiming the gospel, Uh, that number is about 2.6 billion who have heard the gospel but have not yet accepted it. What that means, and here's the sad truth, that there are over 50% of the people on our planet, roughly 3.5 billion, more than that, who have not heard the gospel, and to be honest, don't have a realistic opportunity to hear it. Many of them don't have access to churches. They don't have access to Bibles. They don't have Christian literature. They don't have mission agencies seeking them out. They desperately need to hear the good news. And here's the truth. It's not just people in faraway countries who need to hear that good news. There's people all around us. We live in a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. And here's the truth, and we're going to talk about this this morning. When Jesus chose messengers, you know who he chose as a messenger of the gospel? You and me. He called all of us to be witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ. We've been going through this series. This is our third and final week. I've been calling that Reset. And here's the idea. It's simple. It's that we're living in a peculiar time right now. And I'm encouraging you to use this time as a reset in your life to press the button, so to speak, on spiritual habits and and start over. So maybe as we're talking through these spiritual disciplines, there's one of them that you hear. Like maybe it's God's word and you think, man, you know, I'm not really in God's word. I I need to get in God's word. I'm encouraging you to do a reset. And, and so we've been, we've talked about uh, resetting God's word. We've talked about resetting worship. This morning, I want to talk to you about resetting your witness. You, as a witness for Christ Jesus, what would it look like to press the reset button? So we're going to talk about that, and I want you to be in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be in a few different places in Matthew and in the New Testament this morning, but I want to start here because This is one of the quintessential passages about what God is looking for in a witness. I I love this story. If you you don't know the book of Matthew or you're not familiar with the story, Matthew tells us about Jesus' early life, his his birth, uh, that he was born to Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem, that he grew up in in Nazareth. Uh, Matthew tells us his genealogy, his uh, baptism as he's anointed for ministry. Then he's brought out into the wilderness. But after all that, Jesus begins his public ministry. Scholars think it was probably a period of of three years where he went out and he told people about himself and about the kingdom and and what God was doing. But before he did that, he chose a team. If you don't know the story, there were, uh, or even if you do, there were 12 disciples that Jesus told. And in Matthew chapter 4, we're given a little window and to Jesus calling some of his disciples. And so if you join me in verse 18, you'll see that Jesus once was walking along the Sea of Galilee. It was basically like a gigantic lake where where a lot of people earned their living by fishing. And so Jesus was walking one day and he sees two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they're fishing. In fact, they were casting a net. Now, in those days, that's how you fished, or at least in that area. If you were on a boat, you casted a net. Even if you were on shore, you had little handheld nets that you would throw out, and then you'd pull in the fish. And so he walks along, and he sees these two brothers, and they're fishing, and he calls them to give up everything they have and follow him. Read read along with me. Verse 19, he says, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Look at the words that Jesus gives his disciples. I want you to come and be fishers of men. That's probably uh, the translation that you're most familiar with if if you grew up uh, with the story. 
I want you to be fishers of men. That's men and women. I want you to fish for people. That's a pretty strange thing that he's asking them to do, and yet they probably, even though they didn't maybe know exactly what he meant, they probably had some idea. They were fishermen. They got the idea. I'm just glad they were, were fishermen and not something else. I mean, plumbers of men doesn't sound uh, very good, but thankfully they were fishermen. And so he says, I want you to come out, and I want you to fish for people. And then is probably what at least I think, is the most amazing part of the story. It says they dropped everything. They left their nets. They left their family members. They left their friends. And they followed him. They left everything. I, I want to look at Jesus' words here. I want to make you fishers of men. I want to help you fish for people. I want to take that sentence, and I want to just mine it this morning. Because there is so much in there, and it helps us understand what it really means to be witnesses. But let's just start here. Jesus is calling his disciples. He's telling these men, he's going to them and he's saying, I want you to follow me. Those are his words. I want you to be my disciples, be with me. But notice, in the same breath, he's calling them not just to follow him, but to go and be witnesses. Here's the central truth that I don't want you to miss this morning. That fishing for people is an essential element of following Jesus. Fishing for people is an essential element to following Jesus. That was essentially his call to them. Follow me and fish for people. It's one and the same. He's calling his disciples. Now, I don't want you to miss this either. And it's that you, if you have put your faith in Jesus, are a disciple. You might not think of yourself as one. You might not ever have called yourself a disciple. But you're a disciple. All followers of our, all followers of Jesus are. That's why at the end of Matthew, later on, before he ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples to go and make disciples. Go and make more disciples. He means teach them to to love me and believe in me and become Christians. If you're a Christian, you're a disciple. They're one and the same. And if you are a disciple, notice that it is essential that you fish for people. It's non-negotiable. So Jesus says, follow me and fish for people. If Peter and Andrew would have said no to fishing for people, they would have said no to following Jesus. It was the exact same call. It's one and the same. So it's not optional. The problem is, as Christians oftentimes, I think, and I know I've been guilty of this, is we treat evangelism like it's optional. And let's be honest, some of us might wish it was optional. I want to worship. I want to know Jesus. I want to to be my savior, but I'm not, I'm not comfortable telling other people about him or getting into those conversations, or I don't want to go there. But notice, right off the bat, it is essential and non-negotiable to the call to be a follower of Jesus. Of all the spiritual disciplines, is there any that's scarier for most of us? I don't think so. But we're called to be disciples. We're called to be evangelists. This is a major theme throughout the Bible especially throughout uh, the New Testament, that we have a mission. And so right from the beginning, as Jesus is calling his disciples, he's giving them a mission. We see this other places in the book of Acts, chapter 1. It was a book written by Luke, and it's mostly the story of the New Testament. But it starts actually with the words of Jesus, again, before he ascends into heaven. Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he's telling his disciples here, and remember, that's you, if you're a believer in Jesus. He's telling you, go and be my witnesses. And this sets up the whole book of Acts. Everything that happens after that, everything the disciples do, come from this uh, command. Go and be witnesses. We're called to be fishermen and fisherwomen. That's part of of our duty as Christians. And so for a little bit here, I want to talk about what that means. And and I want to do that by digging in to a a few stories of Jesus talking uh, about fishing and what it tells us about how we're supposed to be fishermen and fisherwomen on his behalf. So I'm going to give you three what I'm calling fishing lessons from Jesus. Here's the first, that people fishing is an active pursuit. It's an active pursuit pursuit. It's something that we go and we do and we have to be intentional about. Again, let's look at Matthew 4, 19. Look at it again. Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Notice here, he's saying, I'm going to 
send you out. You're going to go out and you're going to fish for people. You're going to go with that intentionality. You're going to seek others out and you're going to tell them about me because it's life-saving news. Go fishing. It's not an accident. And if you've ever fished before, you know that that's definitely not an accident. It takes intentionality. You don't often intentionally or accidentally catch fish. When I was a kid, uh, one of my favorite things when I was a teenager, one of my favorite things in the summer to do was I would go out uh, to my, my grandparents' camper. They had a, a place in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, and we would go out and we would fish every day. I mean, we would go out in the morning when the fish were biting. We'd go out uh, sometimes in the afternoon, but always in the, the evening when the fishing was good. And so I remember one time we went out and we would troll the lake and we would have our lines out and we went out one evening. I think it was pretty, uh, pretty early in our adventure and, and I had my line out and I was closest to shore and we got a little too close and so my, my line got tangled in some of the reeds and it just so happened it got really tangled. So we had to stop the boat and float over there and we got over there and I was untangling uh, my line and it just so happened that the lure that was on the end had fallen straight to the bottom. And I didn't really think anything of it, and finally I got it untangled, and I reeled it in, and I noticed as that lure was coming up from the bottom that it was kind of heavy. And so I reeled up, and there, sure enough, on the end was a bullhead. Now, I don't know if you know anything about fishing or bullheads, but a bullhead is a bottom feeder, which means that it is right on the bottom, eating everything that's there, little fish and, and weeds and things like that. I had never caught, and I don't think, a bullhead ever, ever in my life. We didn't go out fishing for them, but it just so happened on this occasion, I accidentally caught a fish. Now, if you've ever gone fishing, you know that that doesn't often happen, and it sure doesn't happen if you don't go out to the lake. If you stay in bed, you're not going to accidentally catch a fish. Because fishing is active. The same is with fishing for people. If we're going to be witnesses for Jesus, it's not going to accidentally happen. And yet, I think sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking, you know what, I'm just going to live my life. If it happens, it happens. Maybe I'll get into a circumstance one day where I'll get to tell someone uh, about Jesus. If we're not intentional, it's not going to happen. It is an active pursuit. Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you out to do this. Here's the truth. God is sending you. That leads to number two, is that uh, second fishing lesson, second fishing lesson, excuse me, is that people fishing is a mission toward all people. It's a mission for all people. Jesus uh, used a parable. It's in Matthew chapter 13. It's later on. And he was telling people with parables often what the kingdom of heaven is like. So he would say things like, kingdom of heaven, heaven is like a mustard seed, or the kingdom of heaven is like this. And on one occasion, he uses a a fishing parable. And it actually fits in with this morning, with witnessing. Notice this, Matthew 13, 47. He says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down in the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Now, we're going to get to the rest of the story, but I just want to stop there. So he says, the kingdom of heaven... It's like fishing, again with the nets. That's how they fish. So they let the net down, they go into the lake, and they catch all kinds of fish. And notice there's some emphasis here on the all kinds of fish. So they let the net down, and they caught everything. They didn't catch one kind of fish or one color of fish or a certain you know, uh, area. They caught all the fish that were around. They caught them in the net. Now, that doesn't really seem like much, but there's something that Jesus is saying here. I think it's intentional that he's giving us this description of all kinds of fish. Because as we fish for people, as we're witnessing, and when I say us, I mean us as the Christian church, our target should be all kinds of people. He's saying it doesn't matter the traditional barriers or the social barriers or the religious barriers. It doesn't matter if they live in the countryside or towns. We saw Jesus going all places in the countryside, in towns, in cities to preach the good news. They had a message to take to all kinds of people. Now, I want to point out here that this is totally different than any other religion in the first century. In fact, there is no evidence ever of a pagan religion sending people out to tell people about their religion. That just didn't happen. But, but Christianity is different. The true gospel is different because it's a life-saving message. We'll get there. But because of that, that is a message for all people. It doesn't matter your background or your tradition or where or how you grew up. Christianity calls for evangelism. It's essential. That means that we're called to everybody, not just people who are like you, 
or people that you like or a certain kind of person. No, everyone around you is someone that Jesus loves, someone who's made in his image. And so we must look for opportunities to share the gospel. And then the last thing is that people fishing is a life-saving mission. A life-saving mission. In other words, it's a life or death situation. Jesus continues in Matthew 13. He tells the story of the net going down and catching all kinds of fish. And he says, when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a a very sobering passage, and I I never want to fly by a a passage that talks about uh, heaven and hell, but here is the gist of what Jesus is saying. He's reminding us of the truth that we see elsewhere in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament. That at the end of this age, at the end of life, there's two places. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And Jesus is reminding us of that reality as he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And it's something that we need to keep in mind. That there's a heaven and a hell and that some will go to heaven. But not everyone will. But here's what I want to make so clear about this. Is this isn't about the good go one place to heaven and the bad go to hell, remember the gospel. No, sinners go to heaven and sinners go to hell. Here's the difference. Sinners who are forgiven go to heaven. Sinners who don't accept the forgiveness don't go to heaven. See, the, the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and me, for every one of us. And if we put our faith in Jesus, if we accept that forgiveness, We will be in eternity with him no matter what we've done in life, no matter how many sins are in our past. We've been forgiven for them. But those who don't accept that good news will not be in eternity with Jesus. That's the reality of what Jesus taught over and over and over again. That means that our mission to bring the good news is a life or death, a life-saving mission And we should preach the gospel. We should tell people about Jesus with that same fire and knowing that this is a a life-saving mission that we are on and that people desperately need to hear the truth. Jesus thought that and Jesus taught that. And Jesus had compassion on people for that same reason. One of my favorite passages is also in Matthew chapter 9. He's with a crowd of people and we're told that he looks out at the people and Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had a heart of compassion and so he preached the gospel. And Jesus calls us to be witnesses like that because he wants to save the world from eternal separation. See, witnessing is a mission of love. Is telling people about the life-saving news. Jesus' coming was an act of love. His death and resurrection were an act of love. Remember, we talked a few weeks ago that spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits are simply the habits of Jesus. Things that he did that we do in our life so that he can work through us. Because the goal isn't to do those things. The goal is to be more and more like Jesus. And here the goal is so that more people would know about Jesus. And Jesus, of course, witnessed all the time. It was probably easier for him to witness because he was witnessing to himself. And maybe in some ways that was harder. But Jesus was a witness in the same way we're called to take his place here on earth and be witnesses and point people to him. See, the fact is that evangelism is incredibly important. It's essential to the church. We're called to be lights to the world, to tell people about the gospel. And don't forget that there's people around you that you see maybe every day or several times a week that desperately need to hear the good news. Coworkers and neighbors, maybe family members and friends. Here's the question I want you to consider. What would it look like for you to be a fisher of men, and a fisher of women, a, a, a fisherman of people? What does that look like in your life. That's what we're called to be. It's essential. So we've been talking about a reset. I want to encourage you, if that's you, if you're listening or watching this morning and you you think, man, I I really need a reset. I encourage you to press the reset. It's a time to, to start over. 
And I think, honestly, most of us need to do this in our witnessing. Now is the time to press reset. And I know it kind of seems silly to talk about witnessing because maybe it's been a while since you've seen people, you know, in, in person, uh, you know, in the situation with, with uh, social distancing. But maybe we can use this time to do that reset and, and prepare ourselves so that when we see people again, we're ready to go. And again, and I, if you've ever heard me talk about evangelism, sometimes we make the mistake when we hear that word of thinking that evangelism is assaulting people with the gospel or it's going and just handing out tracts. No, it's being intentional about our relationships, ones often we already have. When we find those open doors about being willing to go through them, and looking for the doors and being alert to them so that we're there when God presents the opportunity so we can share our lives and share what Jesus is doing in our own lives with others. That's what I believe evangelism is. Maybe it's the time to hit the reset button. And truthfully, I think a huge part of it is being intentional, saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be a witness, understanding that you are a witness if you are a believer of Jesus Christ. But here's the other thing. I think that witnessing isn't just adding things that we're, we're not, or that we're not doing and start doing them. I think if we're truly intentional about our witness, sometimes it's subtracting things from our life that make us not a good witness or things that detract from our witness. For example, is social media hurting your witness? For, for some people, I think that's the truth. You know, one of the things we don't uh, often consider is that when we, anybody goes on a rant on social media and starts drawing lines and starts you know yelling or or making a battle about something that's not crucial what happens is that you're detracting from other people that's hurting your witness if you go on a political rant that really has nothing to do with Jesus Christ or his gospel there's some of your friends or some people watching that who, who might disagree with you on an issue. And if you talk, let's say, uh, with vulgarity and, and uh, offensiveness, what's going to happen is that's going to detract from your witness. I really think as Christians, we should be careful about keeping the main thing the main thing, keeping our eyes on what's really, truly important. And that's not to say we can't have opinions or we can't share them, but I, I'll just ask you, have you, do you consider that? I think for some of us, we need to be really careful about thinking What's affecting our witness? Again, if we're intentional about being witnesses, then we're going to think through things like that. Is the way you, you, that you treat people hurting your witness? When you talk to people, do you treat them with kindness? If someone were to you know, be in church service on a Sunday morning and then walk out uh, of that service and then go talk again with vulgarity and, and uh, not kindness to other people, that's going to hurt their witness. We need to be uh, aware of that. One of the, the biggest uh, beefs that people have with Christians are they, they say that they're, uh, you know, hypocrites. And that's how we get that title, by not being careful about our witnesses, our witnessing. There's things that can detract from our witness. I, I would call it evangelism by commission, things that we do, and evangelism by omission, the things that we don't do. It takes discipline to say the right things. It also takes discipline sometimes not to say the wrong things. Let's call it the discipline of shutting up. Sometimes maybe that's what we're called to do. Again, it comes back to that intentionality. And remember, wherever you are right now in life, whatever your life looks like, God has put you there for a reason. And he's put you around people that I'm not around, that others watching this are not around. And he's given you a a task to be a witness for Jesus. I heard this story recently that I just love. It was an interview with a guy. uh, His name is Joel Marion. And he's a well-known fitness guru in the the health and weightlifting uh, arena. He's very well-known. He's the co-founder of something called uh, Biotrust. And he has today, I, I just read, he has a uh, email list that he sends out to 20 million subscribers, uh, even more than that. So this is a guy with a huge platform. And he grew up a, a Christian and a follower of, of Jesus, but after college, he attended a Christian university for a while, and then he got into the health industry. And for a long time, he didn't really talk about his faith. But then one day, this was several years ago, he was um, sending out these email lists and he would reach literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people with every email. There were people who really wanted to know what he thought about health and wellness. And it dawned on him one day that, hey, I have a platform here 
And I'm writing to people, most of whom don't know anything about Jesus. And so one day he alerted his employees that he was going to do this. And he uh, used an email to just write a little bit about his testimony and share them with Jesus. And he said, I don't know if you have ever thought about this, but here's what I, I believe. And if you want, I'll pray for you. And he said that, and he, he said he kind of braced himself, not knowing if a whole bunch of people, thousands of people were going to unsubscribe. Or maybe they think he was bigoted, and they yell at him, and he just sent it out, and he kind of waited with bated breath, not knowing what was going to happen. And you know what happened? An overwhelming uh, reaction. People were positive towards that. There were people who were sharing their life stories, and people wanting prayer, and people wanting more. And to this day, as he does podcasts and email lists, as his company operates, he uses his platform to talk about Jesus. Now, I don't think any one of us watching this probably has a 20 million person, 20 million person platform, but we all have a platform. We all have people whose lives we speak into. What are some ways that we can use that platform to talk about Jesus? Consider that example again. There's not somebody who, who uh, rams it down people's throats or says, I won't you know, uh, send you my email if you're not a believer. But he uses opportunities to pray for others and to speak of what God's doing in his life when he has the opportunity. That's what witnessing truly is, about being intentional and using the opportunities that were given. You are put somewhere for a reason. So before we close, I'm going to do what we've been doing for the last several weeks. I want to give you three practices to implement into your life. Maybe you're, you know, as we talked about this this morning, maybe you have uh, witnessing as a regular part of your life. You're thinking, you know what, this is, uh, this is something that I do often. Um, I don't need a reset. Maybe these aren't for you. Maybe you're looking for something. Uh, I'll just give you a few suggestions as we talk about this. The first is you could bef- befriend an unbeliever. Befriend uh, an unbeliever. Now, I don't know where you are in life, but I was talking to someone recently, a, a Christian, and he said, you know what, I don't really see people who don't believe in Jesus very often. I go to work, and there's people who are believers. I go home, and my family are believers. Most of the people I see are from my church. And he, when we were talking about mission, he says, I don't know a lot of people that are unbelievers. Now, that's probably not most people's situation, but maybe that's yours. Maybe you're in Christian circles and you don't see people very often who don't believe in Jesus. Maybe take a step to to strike up a relationship with someone who doesn't know Jesus. Now, I want to be careful here. This isn't underhanded. This isn't with false motives. This isn't to say, oh, I'm just going to try to change this person's life or I'm going to try to evangelize to them off the bat. But this is about striking up a relationship and just loving them and just getting to know them and listening to them but also looking for opportunities. God will use the opportunities in our life. Again, this is something we see in Jesus' life. We're going to go through a story in a few weeks that I love of of Jesus uh, with a whole household of people that didn't know anything about him or anything about probably Judaism or about Jesus, and he just befriended them. That was something that Jesus did regularly. And it's showing us that that is part of our witness. He reached out and was intentional. I think we can do the same. The second thing that I would give you as a practice that you could implement is to start asking questions. I want to explain this one because this is a, a little different. Here's the idea. Is that oftentimes as Christians, when we start to tell people about Jesus, we're the ones answering the questions. Have you ever gotten a conversation with someone and you want to tell them about Jesus and they just ask you a bunch of questions? Maybe it's someone who's kind of offended by Christianity and so they're asking you hard questions and you're going, I don't know how to answer this. In fact, that's what scares a lot of us, I think, from evangelizing. We're worried they're going to ask us hard questions and we're not going to know everything. I hear that often. I don't know everything. How could I, how could I get in these conversations? See, here's what I think happens sometimes is we get in these, these uh, places where we're already put on the defensive But when you ask all the questions, sometimes you don't have to do the hard work of actually thinking about things. And so sometimes you'll talk to someone who has the stock answers and they, well, why does God allow evil? Or why are Christians hypocrites? And they'll ask you a bunch of questions and you just kind of back up and you don't know how to respond. But here's something that actually is, is straight from the tactics of Jesus. Ask questions. Ask questions back when people are asking you questions. What that does is that makes you or or makes them 
think about that conversation. Because you can just ask questions and, and not really engage. But as a Christian, we can ask questions, not to skirt, uh, skirt the answers or, or change the subject, but to get deeper into that subject. And so I'll give you a few examples. Someone, you talk to someone, they say, well, Christians, they're so judgmental. You could ask the question, how? How have you seen Christians be judgmental? And maybe in listening to them, you'll hear that, man, they had some bad experiences. Maybe you can speak into that. They say the Bible contradicts itself. If they say that, you could say, where? Where are some places that the Bible contradicts itself? That's a kind of a stock answer. I've heard that quite often. I don't know if I've ever asked where, and people could actually tell me where it has contradictions. But that's something people have heard. So engage, and it'll get you into a deeper conversation. Someone says, why does God allow so much evil? You could say, why do you think? In fact, that's a great answer to most questions is, why do you think? What do you think about that subject? You're asking me. You must have an opinion. What this does is it helps you engage in an actual conversation and not just go on the defensive, trying to give answers to questions that they don't really care about. They're just trying to get rid of you. That's a way that you can get into some deep conversations. Again, Jesus uh, did this a lot. And if you read the Gospels, I would encourage you from now on, when Jesus gets asked questions, notice what he does. He, he, a lot of times he responds with a, a, a question. So he gets asked, hey, should we pay taxes? And he says, whose face is on the coin? Well, they say Caesar, and he says, give it to Caesar. He engages them. He puts it back on them, and he engages with a question. Jesus did this a ton. And I think he's teaching us something about evangelism. And then the third thing I'll give you, and maybe one of the most helpful, is learn a gospel presentation. If you don't know one, you could learn one. There's lots of them. Here's the thing. If, if we're going to be witnesses, we need to be prepared. A long time ago, I, I heard a story of a, uh, a man, and he was in the last moments of his life. He had gathered his family there, and they all knew that he didn't have very long to live. And when he was there, he asked one of his uh, family members who was a Christian, he said, uh, how, do I, how do I get saved? He was not a believer in Jesus, and his family never thought, uh, I think, that he would do that. But he said, how do, I, how do I get saved? And you know what happened? His family member had to go find someone else to come and explain it. Thankfully, that person was able to do this. But here's the thing. We don't want to get caught unprepared. As Christians, by definition, we know the gospel. We've believed in the gospel. You have to believe in the gospel in order to be saved, that Jesus died for you. And we need to be able to not just believe in it, but also to explain it. Because you'll get in situations where maybe somebody asks you straight out, or maybe you have an opportunity to share. Do you know how to explain the gospel? Knowing it can be different than presenting it. A gospel presentation, when I say that, it's simply a way of explaining it. And even though there's one gospel... There's more than one gospel presentation. In fact, there's, there's tons of them. If you uh, have a background in Campus Crusade or Crew, you're probably familiar with the Four Spiritual Laws, which is a, a, a pamphlet and a way that you can walk through the gospel. There's a, a one that's very popular amongst Christians today. It's called Two Ways to Live. It's put out by an Australian group. Uh, incredibly helpful. Both of those have websites where you can learn or pamphlets that you can use if you're um, into, into that, if that makes it easier. I, I use something, I've uh, taught this on several occasions, kind of a four-step explanation, creation, fall, redemption, recreation. It's just walking through the gospel story um, in the Bible, if that's helpful to you. It's similar to the four spiritual laws. Or the Romans Road. Some of you, uh, I know, know this by heart. The Romans Road is a five-verse uh, passageway through the books of, book of Romans. So if you have your Bible out, you can walk through these verses, if you, you know them, and explain the gospel. I've seen and watched people use this, and it works fantastic. It can be really, really good and really helpful. It doesn't matter what exactly it is, but do you know how to explain the gospel? Do you know how to walk through it? Again, knowing it is different than being able to explain it. Paul told Timothy, a young pastor, be ready to preach in season and out. It's a verse that, as a pastor, gives me shivers a little bit. But he says, be ready at all times. You'll never know when you have to preach. And as Christians, I think the same goes for all of us. We should be ready because God is going to open up those gospel conversations. And we should be ready to walk through that door. Because as we saw today, it's an active pursuit. We need to be ready to go out. And tell people about Jesus. Don't be caught unprepared.
So, so there are your three practices. Again, take them or leave them. Maybe you know something, that's, uh, something else that's helpful. You can share it with your group. What a wonderful way to learn from each other. But as we close this series now, not just the message, but the series, is there an area of life where you need a reset? Maybe it's not your witness. Maybe it is. Maybe it's worship or word. Maybe it's another area like, like prayer or purity or something else in your life. Use this time to do a reset on your spiritual habits and let us all remember as we leave, leave today that we're called to be fisher of, fishers of people. I think this is a great one to close on because we're all called. It's essential to the gospel, essential to following Jesus. We're called to go and give people the good news. Will you close with me in prayer? Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the gospel because the, the good news is a, a gift to us that you have sent your son Jesus. He died for a cross. He rose again for us so that we can have eternal life. And Lord, my prayer is that we would take that life-saving mes- message and we would go on your mission and, and tell people about your son Jesus. And so Lord, I pray for the strength and the courage. That's what we need, that you would prepare us through gospel presentations and uh, friendships and other things, Lord. We know that this is a a spirit-led process. And and you you tell us in your word to stay in step with the spirit. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give uh, us the the strength to do that. Give us your spirit, Lord, that we can be ready for those moments. You're going to give us moments. You're going to open doors. So give us the the strength and the courage to walk through. And so, Lord, I thank you again for this. Thank you uh, for everything that you're doing in our lives. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I just want to say again, uh, thanks for for joining us this morning as we we come together in worship. Um, I'll see you next week, whether it's here by video or if you want to come worship with us, you're welcome to do that. Again, if you're looking for more information, you can find that uh, on our website. But thanks again for joining us.